Welcome to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Clare, recovery coach professional. Do you love food, alcohol, drugs, sex, social media, cigarettes, or gambling a little too much? The traditional narrative says that addiction to these vices is the problem. The truth is they are just symptoms. This hit show takes you from recovery to your ultimate life as my special guests and I help you discover how underneath every vice is the addiction to the suffering that developed due to unhealed trauma. So what can you do? Hungry for Answers provides groundbreaking proven solutions from my best-selling spiritual book, Feast and Famine, Healing Addiction with Grace. It's time to stop suffering and start living your ultimate life. You have a divine right to a life filled with love, joy, peace, and abundance. Hungry for Answers starts now. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Hungry for Answers. I want to read a little bit from the write-up for today's show, and because I think it's a really interesting topic. Can you be in recovery way before you stop your addictive behavior? The answer is yes. The moment that you start to look at your trauma patterns in your life, you are in recovery from your suffering. This can begin even in active addiction. And I know that because it happened to me. After all, recovery begins when you say it does. Will you reach your desired long-term outcome? Probably not until you stop the addictive behavior, but it is a valid place to start. So today's guest, Trisha Perito, Master Addiction Specialist, Recovery Lifestyle Enthusiast, industrial industri- Industry Thought Leader, will talk with us about the different layers of healing that need to take place to ensure long-term recovery. So welcome to the show, Trisha. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, you're welcome. So I start the show with the same question for everyone, which is, have you ever been so hungry in your life that you were not sure where the answers were coming from? And if, and if the answer is yes, if you could share your experience. Wow, that's a big yes. In so many different periods of life, in different years, and from different angles, um, I, I can say you know, I can date all the way back to a young child, even at four, like really falling into that, that pattern of just always seeking for answers somewhere and feeling like I was getting them, whether it was from exercise, because yes, I started competitive exercise or sports when I was very young uh, and, and all of these things. So I can say that you know, I was, I was always hungry for answers, but didn't realize what was being presented to me. Does that answer that question for it you? Does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. And, and without that, going into the whole story, which would take hours upon hours yeah. um, to, but it to is go true. through. It is true. Sometimes, you know, thinking about what you said, we're hungry for answers, and the answers are being presented to us, but sometimes we just can't see them as the answer because we're expecting something else, right? Like we're expecting the only answer to come a certain way. Yes. Right. If I could only be the best at this, then the answer would come. But then when I'm the best at this and it doesn't come, it's like, well, okay, the next thing, the next thing. And, and it's always... I call it seeking for peace, comfort, joy, relief, value, validity, and worthiness in things outside of ourselves. Yeah, yes. And so um, let's talk about, let's talk about this topic. What does it mean that recovery can take place even before you have ceased your addictive behavior? For, for me and for the work that I do, it means that we have the ability to begin healing things 
because a, a lot of times we don't realize that it's the substance, right? Or, mm -hmm. or that that's a part of it. We think if, if I change, if I change, you know, my, my relationship with my physical body, if I change my relationship with my spiritual being, if I change my relationship, right? And, and all of those things are very valid and very valuable. Because we do, we do need to look at, you know, six to eight different categories of life and, and truly feel them and define them as we need them to be so that we can see ourselves in the vision that we want to see ourselves. So not everything is ready to heal at the same time. And, and so if, if we're feeling unsettled in life, if we're feeling unfulfilled and we, we may, we may start with our spiritual being. We may, we may start to connect on a deeper level with whatever spirituality is to us. And that, that starts the healing process. And then we might move to something different. Um, and, and we may not get to a space where we're ready to let go of that last thing. In my journey, uh, you know, I worked really hard on my addiction for 30 years, but my recovery journey was 20, well now over 25 years. Mm -hmm. And and it, you know, it started with healing from childhood traumas and, and, and then the healing of other things such as eating disorders, food addiction, uh, body dysmorphia, right? Those things had to start first because I had to start fueling my body for my brain to even function properly. Yes. Yes. And then I had to realize that I was worthy of unconditional positive regard. And I was, you know, because I had to heal from domestic violence, sexual assault, rape. And, and, and so I had to do that healing. And then I had to feel acceptable as a being from the inside. And then I could move into looking at some of those external things, right? Like alcohol, benzodiazepines, things like that. So you're saying that, which I think we're on the same page, um, the ultimate long-term healing and long-term recovery requires us to, to have an integrated system, mind, body, spirit, and emotion that's, that's in alignment. But what I find what's interesting that you're saying is that sometimes we have to start somewhere, right? And whatever we're it's almost like our healing begins. I don't, I don't know how we choose where we begin. Maybe our, maybe our soul says, oh, maybe, you know, she can look at this now, or he can look at that, right? There's a desire to be in recovery, right? Really? Somewhere, yeah. somewhere inside of you, right? right? And, and, and then there's this, um, uh, because I think, would you agree that most people would say that you have to stop the addictive behavior before you go into recovery? That's why I found this topic so interesting. I would think people, I think people think, well, <clears throat> I'm not healing, I'm still using. Okay, so, you know, again, we can make this like hour long conversations, right? And, and, because there are categories, there are varying degrees of severity. So yes, if we have you know, an extremely high um, severity of chemical addiction, where we have to, you know, say, you know, do that detoxification civilization period, absolutely. But you know, for for many people, especially when we're talking about harm reduction and early intervention. It's about learning to live for yourself first mm -hmm. without feeling guilty, selfish, punished, or restricted. And so, you know, sometimes it's, and, and in my practice, a lot of times we do it in what feels like backwards because we do, we, it's, it's, what do I, how do, what do I need to do for me? How do I even learn how to live for myself first? Mm -hmm. Because you know, for whatever reason. And, and then, you know, sometimes, you know, people's goals or aspirations are to learn how to, you know, correct their life without letting go 
of we'll say alcohol, right? Because there's a lot of low severity or lower severity addictions out there that maybe don't have to go away right away, that we, there are other things we have to fix and learn that we really don't need it. So that's what, you know, so we have to be very meticulous about that. And, and I don't know about you, but, you know, I do have to, you know, when people come in, I have to assess for their level of severity so that we can even find a starting point. And most people who, who haven't, you know, already done the journey or the work or the study or the, you know, investigations and, and you know, looking at theories and modalities and methods, you know, they don't know where to start. But, but when you reach out to somebody that, that can help you find out where to start, like I refer people all, all day long to a stabilization place. Like mm -hmm. we, we've got to, you've got to be cognitively present. You've got to be able to, you know, track conversation. And, you know, so sometimes we have to do more severe intervention, but the starting point can be in various places. Yes. So you mentioned um, the true the true starting point for for some people is learning to um, live for yourself first. Can you explain what you mean by living for yourself first? Yeah, um, you know we we have this ability to create a lot of internal pressure, right? Um, so you know, I guess a short statement would be that you know I believe. And I and I've studied all things addiction, process, behavioral, and chemical, is that addictions, negative attachments, and the habits that hold us hostage, you know, they're they're seated in in that pressure to perform. Like mm -hmm. there's a reliance on on things outside of ourselves to bring us that peace, that joy, comfort, relief, value, validity, and worthiness that I have mentioned already. So. What we're, what we're looking at is, is this need to, you know, not put other things in, in a place of authority or a position of, of effectiveness that aren't necessarily effective. And, and so if we, if we look at putting ourselves first, that means, you know, I know what I need. I know what fills my soul. I know what's going to make me feel calm, centered, grounded in any given moment. And it's okay. I can still be that people pleaser. I can still be a good wife. I can still be a good husband. I can still be a good mom or dad, even if I put myself first. Mm -hmm. And that might mean that every morning I need an hour to myself to set my day up with the right intention to serve me from the inside out. And it's okay to, to not see eye to eye. We, we go through life, you know, constantly comparing, um, feeling jealous or envious or, mm -hmm. you know, this longing for things that we see or perceive that we don't have or that others have. And, you know, so it, it, really, it really instigates a feeling of not enoughness. Or we feel like, oh, I've got all this stress and all these things are happening to us. And, yeah. and so we, we rely on this end of the day, you know, three glasses of wine or, you know, you know, whatever cocktail, you know. And, and so it's, I work really hard. I deserve this. Well, no, you know, it, it, it's really not that. It's why are we carrying? Why are we feeling our bag full of stuff all day long, all day long? And we just never empty. And so if we, if we start living for ourselves, we, we learn how to not fill the bag or we learn how to effectively empty it and, and we learn how to move forward. But we also learn how not to future trip, compare and put a lot of anxiety inducing things into our life. And so, you know, we can actually be in the moment and, yeah. and, and actually look at what we need to serve us. What I light I want to see myself. Yeah, so talking about putting ourselves first, mm -hmm. there's an expression I once learned that it's not selfish, it's self-full. That when we, when we can learn to put ourselves first, we fill ourselves with what is most important to us. And we also fill ourselves with light 
And so we can actually be the best version of ourself for other people. But we also learn, <laughs> thank you, we also learn that what we don't want, right? When you put yourself first and, you know, we, we've spent our time, if we have not ever put ourselves first, trying to validate ourselves and feel better about ourselves through helping others, right? That's where we're, we're constantly looking for that. But when we're self-full, we say, is that in my highest and best good? Is that in alignment with what I want to accomplish, what I want to achieve? Is it really helping me to heal? Is it even true? I love that when, when you ask yourself that, when you're working on your own empowerment and someone says something to you to try to pull you out of it, not necessarily on purpose or with intention, it's just how you've communicated in the past, because really, when you start putting yourself first, all the other people in your life are used to putting used to you putting them first. So there's a whole thing that has to happen in in the in the in the, in the um, relationship, and you know sometimes things will come out that don't are not that sound disparaging to you or make you want to feel bad or guilty, and you have to just say, is that really true? Or is this person being disappointed in me because I'm not dropping my own self-worth and my own selfful self to fill their cup, per se, to make them feel better? What do you think about that, Tricia? Absolutely. You're hitting all the bells and whistles, right? I, I mean, the, the people-pleasing codependency is as much of an addiction as anything else. And, and so, you know, if we start to say, wow, how do I want to see myself experiencing living? How do I want to see myself experiencing my environment? And how do I want to see myself leading by example for others so that they know how to receive me, mm -hmm. right? How do I want others to see me? How do I want others to treat me? I have to lead by that example. So when, when people are used to you being that go-to or, you know, that one that will always drop everything for them, you know, there's really an art form and, and go through a series of uh, skill sets and tactics that we learn how to articulate, you know, um, to create that space, those, those, uh, that, that effective filtrating boundary system, you know, that gets backed by very concrete and beneficial limits and limitations that, that there becomes this, you know, unspoken level of, again, unconditional positive regard and respect between yourself and yourself and yourself and the people in your life that you love, honor, and cherish. Right? It would have, and, it would, and it's, excuse okay. me, I'm sorry. It would, it would appear that the perception has to begin with your perception of yourself. Mm -hmm. Who, who do you want to become next? And, and then the perception of your loved ones and colleagues about you comes second. And so this is really important. I, I like this conversation because it's really bringing it back to recovery. I believe what Trish was saying earlier was that sometimes we have to find that, that part of us, that, that beingness in us, the one that is putting our being self full, right? before we can even take on healing from an addictive behavior. And so we're going to be going to break now. You're listening to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Claire, and we'll be right back. And welcome back to Hungry for Answers with me, Robin Claire. To learn more about my work, please go to clarity.com. That's C L A R E dash I T Y. And I'm with Trisha Perito of Turning Leaves Recovery. So, Trisha, how can people learn more about your work? It's really easy. You can, you know, just go to turningleavesrecovery.com. Mm -hmm. There are links there to where you can you know, surf around on my platform, look at, you know, different things that are available. Um, it just makes it really easy. Or 
you can write down my name and Google Trisha Parada. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty easy to find. Mm-hmm. That's great. <laughs> That's great. So <clears throat> we're going to jump into your work now. We're going to jump into Turning Leaves Recovery. Why, why did you begin this um, recovery process or program? Programs, I know that you do multiple things. And can you talk about the, the foundational parts of, of, of Turning Leaves Recovery? Absolutely. And, you know, to, to keep it, you know, condensed, Turning Leaves was born out of my own journey. Um, I, I found myself in, in, a, in a place of physi- physiological addiction that I had never experienced. So you know, a loss of control for a control freak was very difficult. So, you know, I went to a 30-day stabilization process detoxification to be safe because it was alcohol and benzodiazepines. And um, for those of you who maybe don't know what that is, it's Xanax is, is a common, um, common product. Anyway, um, so in that, in that treatment period, you know, afterwards, you know, that was great. But then, you know, I was sent home, go to AA and do weekly therapy. Neither of those really were what I needed. I needed the now what, what's next? Like, how do I open the refrigerator? Like I was in my mid (laughs) forties, you know, like I started drinking when I was 12. I needed to learn how to open the refrigerator without reaching for a beer. I, I I just needed a, a lot of other things. So you know, I went, I started going to school. I took a class. I wanted to learn what happened. Why did that combination? Cause my, you know, my physician knew I was a daily drinker. And mm-hmm. so I went to school fast forward five and a half years, you know, I, so I, I was really interested in that, that, that gap, right? Because AA is wonderful. Therapy is wonderful. You know, um, therapeutic groups are amazing but it's the day in, day out when you go home to the same house, the same spouse, kids, bills, environment that was previously not working out, like you weren't perceiving it correctly. So, you know, I got really interested in that piece. So when I originally created uh, Building Milestones, which is now Learn to Live Free, um, it, it was to fill that now what, what's next. Yeah, I love that. How do I experience my environment differently? Like, how do I learn to go day in, day out? How do I, how do I get through post-acute withdrawal that lasts for two years without, you know, getting the efforts or becoming emotionally derailed or whatever? How do I learn to sit in and move through those uncomfortable things without going back to my conditioned old ways of being? So I, I was learning how to condition new ways of being, the way I wanted to see myself. And and so I took all of these evidence-based practices. I even studied coaching as an effective psychological practice in process behavioral addictions. And and I took all of of the things that I studied. I also worked in every level of addiction treatment. So, and and still found that this was a gap. And in, in that, after the launching, I started seeing it effective for other people, I'd get phone calls, you know, like, I don't have an addiction, but I wonder if you can help me because everything you're talking about, those skill sets and tactics, like, I feel like I need them, hmm. right? So, so, so that's we're talk- how it was born. <laughs> so we're talking about, we're talking about the idea that you come out of, you know, a substance abuse, a substance uh, detox, and then you're walking back into your life, right? And so there's there were stressful parts of that life, and and there were also wonderful parts of that life, and not wonderful parts. So the question is, how do you move forward, almost keeping the things you want to keep, and changing the things that you want to change, and then learning to uh, accept the things that you can not change and so then you had you you created this this uh, company turning leaves recovery because you also came out of out of um out of that place and didn't really know what to do next so i i love that so what what have you found are the things that really the foundational things that people must learn to do 
So the common thread that I find is that, and, and this was really true for me, that an underlying thing is, is we often feel when we go back to our environment, you know, the perception originally was that our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our opinions, our beliefs, needs, wants, dreams, aspirations aren't seen as valid or holding any value. We feel very dismissed, undervalued, unheard in life. And, and that's an internal thing that comes out of trauma. So, you know, the very first thing we want to do is, is seriously get to know ourselves, right? Intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, you know, there's, there's six very important categories that we look at and see what, see how we need to break it down. Where do we need to start? And it, in the, in the survey, it's very easy to determine where, you know, what, what we're feeling, hearing, saying, and believing about ourselves. And then, you know, we, we want to learn how, where we operate, you know, are we very emotionally minded? Are we, you know, like running hot? Do we, you know, overly rationalize everything? How do we, we need to learn how we can get to that intuitive wise mind and operate there. So, you know, that of course takes looking at how you're functioning, ending knee jerk impulsivity and reactivity, a life skill that we don't get taught. Um, because we're, you know, very externally driven. And, and so it's, you know, one of the very important steps is to learn where am I externally driven and how can I, how can I become internally mm -hmm. mindful mm -hmm. and, and operating? And again, you know, that filtrating boundary system, boundaries in my work are completely different than, you know, the, the general consensus of what boundaries are. For me, that's limits and limitations. I'm big on definitions of words. Um, you know, we learn all kinds of ways to use amazing adjectives to truly describe how we are in any moment. Uh, because fine isn't isn't a good one. You know, fine is a very ambiguous word. So we have so to, you know, we have to learn how to get effective and do what works. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. You're asking you're asking clients to learn to live from their internal world and and see the world from their own intuitive mind and their own beautiful heart but what happens if they're so scarred that that internal place is a scary place to be or a place that doesn't feel very loving to them how do you work with them then that is such a real thing and an amazing question it has to be done in, in bite-sized, tolerable pieces and chunks. So, you know, first we have to learn the art form of creating categories and breaking things down and, and being able to, to look at something and say, what piece of this serves me? What piece of this has, has any value or validity to carry around and keep? And if it doesn't, you know, we, we have to learn what pieces to throw away and what pieces we can put on a shelf because it will serve us going forward. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, these are all metaphorical things that we, we build and create um, in, in our journey and our time together. But, you know, we, have, we, we don't wanna carry, carry things around that no longer serve us. I, I like to say you know, any day you wake up without a chalk line around body is a great day. Right, we get to move forward. There are no do-overs. So we really need to learn how to, if I can't repeat that moment and make it any better, like I need to learn how to let it go. Right. And, and so there is a lot of work in that space because people don't know how to break it down. And, and, and a good example of that is a, a client who, who just really felt like her whole family, you know, at, she had attached this feeling of unworthiness and, and you know, the black sheep. Like I just, you know, nobody, I, I just don't fit in anywhere. And, and she had attached it so broadly and over years of work, kept attaching this to so many places. When we broke it down, do you know, we got that broken down to one single person in her life. It was her relationship with her sister and her sister only. And once we got it to that by, you know, this reverse categorizing and, and looking at in bite-sized pieces, like palatable pieces, that it was just that one, like it was so easy because then she could just heal that one relationship. 
right and and allow the others to be to be effective and and healthy and and fulfilling yes that's a that's a great example because i'm sure the other people in her life were like why why does she react this way or why why can't i break through to her that i this isn't me this isn't I'm not doing this. And um, I'm thinking about in Feast and Famine, my book, uh, the last step of the healing process is grace must be allowed. You know, grace in the form of coming to your own own answers or grace, uh, you know, the right healer to come into your life or the right program. But when you associate yourself as that black sheep or that's your role and you're sticking to it, um, you you cannot allow the grace in so when you do see that this was not even maybe something that was yours i mean it could be something that's carried by all of society and you're holding on to it right you're absorbing it maybe you're empathic and you're saying you you've always been empathic and you take on emotions that are not even yours So it's always so important to step back and say, is this mine? Do I actually believe this? Again, I'm going back to that sentence or that question. Is it true? Is it true for me? And when you decide whether it's true for you and or you decide it isn't true for you, but you want something better, that is when grace will come in with in whatever form it arrives um, to help you to heal, like finding finding Trisha at Turning Lee's Recovery, you know, what, whatever it is, working with me on writing your recovery story. Things just arrive when you're willing to let go of the story that you've been carrying and the story and, and heal this suffering that has kept you in addictive behavior and really kept you suffering. Thoughts on that? You. I mean, just all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, she's just talking about this one particular lesson that we focus on early, which is, you know, the core non-physical feeling check-in. And and it's where we learn how to ask ourselves these questions, right? Right here, right now in this moment, I feel irritated, agitated, annoyed, frustrated, whatever it is, right? We, We learn how to use these adjectives, but then we go to the real meat, which is what's driving it. What's driving it in this moment? How much of it is is coming from within me and how much of it's coming from outside of me? And what do I need to do in this time and space to change, shift, morph, whatever I need to do with it? And because we do, we take on so much. I find so many people that struggle with with this numbing out, whether it's sugar shopping, um, you know, people pleasing, codependency, overbooking your calendar, or the traditional alcohol and you know illicit drugs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that that it's we're taking on. We're so empathic. We take on what we perceive other people's thoughts, feelings, emotions, opinions, and beliefs are about us, and it, it's a premonition. We never even bother to inquire. We never even bother to say, "Hmm, I'm." I'm hearing this this way. Mm-hmm. And, you know, can you clarify? Anyway, I, I could go into so many different depths and layers of how interesting and intriguing it is to get to know ourselves in this process. Mm. And I think, too, it's important to give yourself permission to feel. I don't think a lot of, I don't think we know that we have that, right? And, um, and so, feel, feel your emotions, stay with them, allow the answers to come, Um, you know, sit with them, feel them, cry if you have to, shout if you have to, all of those things actually put out the emotional charge associated with that emotion, and then you're able to see more clearly what are the next steps for you. But when you're stuck in the emotion of a situation, you're not always able to see what should I do next? <clears throat> What's best for me? What's best for the people that I love? So don't run from your emotions. Don't run away. 
you know, keep them close to you. So in our last two minutes, what, what would you like to let people know about Turning Leaves Recovery? Like what, what, how can they um, work with you directly or your team? You know, really, you know, my passion is to 100% make life better for people that are seeking life recovery, uh, you know, truly equipping them with the, the life skills that is going to help them set the right aspirations so that they can live life, they can live it freely and, and truly step into, you know, their momentum. So, you know, the, the best way, again, to reach me is at turningleavesrecovery.com. Fill out a contact me form, you know, just give me a little bit of insight of where it is that you're struggling and, and we'll find your right fit. In fact, I have a discover my right fit consultation. That's completely complimentary. Um, you know, I just think it's really important that we, we take time to, to gather the skills, distress tolerance, emotion regulation, find effective self-soothing tactics for ourselves and truly get to know ourselves so that we can create that life with filled with the esteem that we need and also to learn how to make it lifelong manageable and maintainable, which is so crucial. We stop our recovery journeys far too soon. And, yes. and that's why I offer programs that vary in length and that's between you and I in, in our consultation. Um, yeah. space of, of how much time we might need to spend together. So so just to summarize, what I love about Trisha's program is that she helps you when you're ready to be in long-term recovery. She creates a path to get you there. She's not just looking at uh, you not using a substance, but she's looking at the integration of your mind, body, spirit, and emotion, and why you have to have all of them working together because when one is not working well, it affects the others. And that creates an environment for you to be able to have the life that you most desire and one that will keep you clean. So thank you so much, Trisha, for being here today. And again, turningleavesrecovery.com to connect with Trisha. And after we return from the break, I will be talking to you about some very interesting information from Feast and Famine. So stay with us. Hello, and welcome back to Hungry for Answers. It's me, Robin Claire. So the last part of my show, I, I realized in the opening one day that I said that this show is based on feast and famine, healing addiction with grace. And I thought, well, why don't I take the last segment each time to talk about information from the book that, that could help our, our audience. And so uh, this morning when I was thinking about what this part would be, I actually, I closed the book twice and opened to the same page twice. <laughs> so as someone that's divinely guided, I know that I'm supposed to read this to you. It's a poem by Rumi um, and um, explains the path of the spiritual teacher, I think. It said, the breezes at dawn have secrets to tell you. Don't go back to sleep. You must ask for what you really want. Don't go back to sleep. People are going back and forth across the door sill where the two worlds touch. The door is round and open. Don't go back to sleep. And so I was reminded this weekend, I did a spiritual retreat for my clients, um, and we did it up in Gloucester, Massachusetts on Good Harbor Beach. And every day um, I got up at sunrise or before sunrise, and I went out onto the beach because I didn't want to go back to sleep because I knew that there would be so much information out there for me that I could hear because I'm, I was so relaxed into the elements of the beach and the listening to the waves and the birds and the smells, you know, and it was cold up in Massachusetts this time of year, but I didn't care because I knew that there were messages for me in that element. So the question really becomes, how, how does one stay awake to the divine possibilities while being still grounded in the physical world, right? Like, because if you think about my experience, I was walking on the beach 
there were many people walking on the beach. And that was a very grounded physical experience. But I was also trying to listen to my own inner divinity and the external divinity that was present with me there. And so, again, I wanted to go over a few ways that you could learn to listen to the divine possibilities while, be, while staying grounded on this earth plane, because that's important too. You are a spiritual being having a human being experience. And so you need to live well in the physical mind, body, spirit, and emotion, but also follow your path of divine service. So the first way is what I clearly just explained, which was take a walk. Always take a walk in nature when you're looking to make that connection to from the divine realm, from the spiritual realm to your own life and ask for what you want. Remember Rumi said, ask for what you want. That is so important. We spend a lot of our time asking for what we don't want. And what do I mean by that? There's so many things. I don't have enough blank. I don't, I wish that wouldn't happen. When you ask in the, in what, for what you don't want, unfortunately, the laws of the universe bring you more of what you don't want. Um, my favorite expression is worrying is like praying for what you don't want. So when you do want something, ask for what you want. And as you've heard in the, in the beginning of my show, we are all entitled to a life of love, joy, peace, and abundance. So ask for that. Ask for ways that you can have more love, joy, peace, and abundance. So another way to have that divine connection while you're living your grounded physical life is to write your own story. As a writing coach, I have seen over and over again, people who have written their stories become so much more grounded and connected through the art of writing. And that's why I love it so much. I love being a writing coach. I'm a writing teacher. I'll be introducing in December a new program called The Write Recovery, W-R-I-T-E. I find writing is a way to get to the heart of what you need to know about yourself. And it's just you and the paper or you and your computer keys. You're not looking in anybody else's eyes. You're not trying to find the words that, that you feel will not hurt them. You're really just writing for yourself. And when I first started to write prior to um, becoming an author, I would wake up and I would write a letter to God and it would be, dear God. And I would just start writing what I needed, what I wanted to have in my life and what I needed to, to share. And so those letters were very important to me. Also, another suggestion I give to my clients is to every day, write down what you think your soul wants you to know today. Doesn't take very long, but it's a very profound way to know what your inner guidance is trying to share with you. Another is to learn and work with a professional to ground your soul into your physical body. You know, when we've experienced trauma, which we all have, sometimes little pieces of our soul escape from us and go into our energetic field the, and because they're hiding, because it's not safe in our physical body. So I invite you to work with an energy healer to bring back those little pieces of your soul back into your, back to the community of the rest of your soul, because it's now safe. It's safe to be there. And when you feel safe in your body and safe in your soul, then you can even hear the divine more clearly. And the last is um, no more hiding. You know, be courageous enough to be vulnerable and be able to serve others from this place of healed energy. And so when you become vulnerable, you there's there's lots of grace that will arrive because you're not you're not you're in surrender you're in surrender and we know I talk about surrender a lot surrender is that place where you're just like I'm done I give up I don't know how to fix this myself and I'm going to take 
whatever comes to me as grace as a way to fix that. And that vulnerability allows you to step out into the world more and as a healed person and serve, serve yourself first, your community, your family, serve the divine, whatever is important to you. And so I want to say to you that you are never alone, never alone. You always have the support of recovery groups, of professionals in the world, of your clergy, of hopefully your family and friends. And you also can also go inside. Here, I just shared with you some experiences and ways to find that connection to your own heart, to your own intuition, your own soul. Remember that your intuition is the voice of your soul. And so when you go inside, there are solutions for you that come to you internally in the form of grace. And then of course, there's the grace that arrives from others who are willing and able to help you. So I invite you to do that. I invite you to join us next time on Hungry for Answers. This is Robin Clare and have a wonderful day. Thank you for tuning into Hungry for Answers. Learning to love ourselves is the one true solution to addiction. Make a commitment to healing today and see how you can reach your ultimate potential. Remember, you have a divine right to a life filled with love, joy, peace, and abundance. To learn more about me and my offerings, please go to clarity.com. That's Claire, C-L-A-R-E, dash I-T-Y dot com. See you next time.